So um, I'm going to start. Um, welcome and thanks for coming. Um, today I'm going to present my latest volume. Uh, it's called The Secret Life of Bad Bishops. And in this book, uh, I'm trying to get an, a complete understanding of what the bishop is and what it can and what it cannot. Um, <coughs> my thinking is that um, when I see commentaries to games, and I often see that uh, the bishop is called bad um, too soon, if people think it looks bad because it's placed behind its own pawn, it, they're very quick to, to call it a bad bishop. So what I'm trying with this book is to um, to describe the bishop in a way so it's um, so it's possible to get a more nuanced view of it. So because the seemingly bad bishop is not always bad, it depends on other things in the position. So um, the book contains positions from uh, the opening, um, the middle game, and the end game. And uh, I will start up out with an opening line to tell you about uh, what I call the double-edged bishop. And um, it's not a bad bishop, it's not a good bishop, it's, uh, it's simply the bishop. Uh, and only further play and analysis will show if this double-edged bishop is in fact bad or good. So it can either show its potential or uh, yeah, the dangers of it can, uh, and it can become bad. So it, it really depends on many factors. Um, the end game. Um, basically, the reason why I included some end game position was <coughs> that I wanted to see what happens to the bishop when it's completely isolated. Uh, what's, um, if it's only bishop versus knight, or if it's only bishop versus rook. Um, what, what's happening? What, what can the bishop do? So uh, these two end games I included in the end game section. And uh, as far as I know, uh, bishop versus rook is not treated um, exhaustive in, in books that I've seen. I think I've spent 45, about 50 pages on it. And um, one of the things I realized when I looked at uh, bishop versus knight in games was that uh, sometimes it's actually very good to place the pawns on the same color as the bishop, because then the pawns are easier to, uh, to defend. And um, you often hear the notion that uh, bishop on the same color as the pawn, then it's a bad bishop. But uh, if you have an endgame where the king and the pawns can, can do the attacking, then it's okay that the bishop defends the, the pawns. So uh, again, it depends on, on other factors. And the middle game, uh, of course, there's a lot of grandmaster games that I go through. And there are also an exercise section towards the end, 30 exercises for the, for the reader to solve. But let's start out with the opening line that I present in the book. Um, and it's, it's a line from the French Defense Advanced Variation. And here, many moves have been played, but um, I'm looking at this particular move, which is quite interesting, I think. The idea if white takes here, you can immediately win back the pawn. Because, um, yeah, the pawns are hanging here. So the main line goes like this. It is also possible to play this first, and then white takes, and for instance wants to keep take there, then we have a position like this. It's also possible, but let's concentrate on the main line. Go like goes like this, and um, yeah, here we have it. In a moment, this bishop will come to e6, and to many, this looks like a very bad bishop, right? It's like it cannot do anything. It's 
behind its own pawn and uh, it's like a strong pawn. Yeah, it's like a strong pawn. Um, so I would call this bishop a uh, double edged bishop or DEB um, because it's simply too early to call it bad. I mean, you because there are many other pieces on the board and. Uh, Another thing is that black actually gained some space here uh, on the king side. Um, and uh, so it really depends on what how, how the game is developing. Um, white also has a bishop here on c1 that could potentially be, um, be bad, but again it's too early to, to say. And we also notice that that white has some space here in the center uh, with e5. Um, the main idea of this position is if white, for instance, castles, um, black can go bishop e7, and now he is actually threatening to play g5. Oh, that's an idea he would like to play, and if white plays h4, you can simply take it. So this is why white often doesn't castle, because then the rook defends h4. So another idea is to play knight c3, with the idea of transferring the knight, maybe to f4 later. But then black can play this move, bishop b4. And after something like this, um, this is an this is an interesting exchange, bishop versus knight, because um, so it's like black is isolating this bishop even more, but at the same time he's also isolating his own bishop. So it's like an equal trade. So and um, yeah, something like this, the main line. So. If white wants to avoid this, he can maybe play a3, and then move the knight to c3 and then e2. Um, but maybe a3 is not a move that you really want to play. So um, they could continue something like this. And after something like this, now <coughs> this is actually a threat. Because um, Black has, Black has this bishop on e6, so he should be a bit careful that he doesn't exchange all of the pieces, and then this bishop on e6 will become isolated. Um, and the more isolated it, it gets, it, the more is the risk of it becoming bad. So h6 here is the move. And then, for instance, white would play h5, and you know, it's, the game is going. Um, I want to show you a game, Swing Swesnikov and Janin. This is actually the first game where the idea of bishop b4 was played, so it's called uh, Janin's move. So, another move is takes e3, but let's concentrate on the main line. So what black basically does is he has this, he has good control of the light squares, uh, very good control. So he places um, the pawns here to, to try to control some dark squares. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. What I want to sh show you now is. Um, It's like a lot of pieces has been exchanged, and now we have this fight knight versus bishop. And this is a very interesting fight, because it's two completely different pieces, but they have approximately the same value. Um, the bishop is colorblind, can only go on the light squares, and the knight is, can go on both squares, but it changes color with every move it makes. So, so it's quite a coincidence that these pieces have the same value, I think. 
So this fight between knight and bishop is, I mean, one of the most interesting in chess. So let's take a few more moves. Here the, the game was actually drawn. Um, and um, I just want to continue with a few moves, just to show you that black is not worse. It, because this bishop on e6 doesn't look too good, but on the other hand, it, he, all these weaknesses are defended. And uh, so he has no problems there. And he can still do some, some attacking, um, because white has some weaknesses too. I can point out d, d4 or f2. For instance, if we exchange some pieces here. Um, let's try to... Queen takes a5. And black could exchange. And now, for instance, he could go rook c2, attacking uh, f2. So this is a position where um, we have an additional rook on the board. And because black has this extra rook, he's able to attack these two weaknesses on the dark squares. Um, if we consider what I call the worst case scenario, if we remove the rooks from the board, it is possible that black will face some problems in the end game. It's not a pleasant end game. It's white, I think, ha has a risk-free uh, winning attempt there. Um, but uh, with an extra pair of rook, the situation is uh, completely different. I think black is completely okay here. I mean, if white goes back, uh, black can just repeat if he wants. Um, yeah, he could even try to uh, um, go for more. I mean, if white gets too ambitious, then suddenly um, it becomes clear that this rook is very active and um, there are definitely some weaknesses to attack in, in white's camp. And without the rooks, these weaknesses wouldn't have, have been there. So, my point is here that um, you cannot just look at the bishop, you have to see like um, the remaining pieces uh, and space. These are the two main other factors to consider in the position. Of course there are many other factors to consider, but uh, as I show a lot of games in the book, I will of course pinpoint the the different, um, yeah, uh, each position is unique, so it has to be treated differently. Um, I do that in the book. So, um, by the way, um, a funny thing in this position is that I explained to you a little bit about the theory before. Actually, I, I recommend this novelty, king f1, because um, you never really castle anyway, and then you play h4, and you try to get the rook out, and you want to make this knight maneuver, and you don't want to play a3, so why not just move the king to f1 right away? White always does it anyway later, so... Um, it's quite interesting. But uh, basically I think black is okay in this position. Um, the idea behind um, black's bishop e6 is a little bit um, like in the game of soccer. I mean, you, you just, um, as black, you, you just uh, assign one piece to defense. Okay, I have the bishop on e6, it's a thick pawn. But it doesn't really matter, because uh, it can stay there for a long time. I have other pieces that can do the attacking. I mean, I'm, I'm not passive because of this bishop, because um, my position overall is not passive. I have others, I can do other things. Um, so, uh, so that's very important um, in positions that 
you can assign one piece to defense if you have attacking uh, other uh, attacking options. Um, so I, I call it the gold keeper logic. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, I don't do it in the book, but um, this is the logic uh, behind it. Um, So this is again the same position, slightly different move order. Um, and now we come to an interesting point of the game. Um, because here black plays b5. And if the knight moves somewhere, um, it's possible to just, uh, I think, why not do it with the bishop? Because the rook is hanging. So, white has to play c5, black takes it, and then. Uh, I think actually b5 by black is a very strong move because uh, the move you want to play here, what, what should white play in this position? I mean, what do you want to play with white? b takes, right. So um, he, he ended up playing b takes c5. So, um, so, um, why didn't he take with the with the D pawn? So that that's quite an interesting question. I think it's the whole logic behind this B5 idea. It's, I think it's brilliant. If he takes with a D pawn, then Black can take on B4, and then there is the move Bishop A6, attacking G7, right? And if if now Black takes, White takes, and you have you know, a dream position with uh, excellent knight uh, against uh, this bishop. But that's not the whole problem. The problem is that you, you, you have a motor over here and uh, these pawns over here are weak. I mean, this is a disaster for, for black, definitely, and there's a past pawn here. So, uh, but it's also important to notice that uh, this is only, Black's position here is bad, but not only due to the bishop. I mean, there are many other factors that make Black's position very bad. Um, so you cannot blame it all on the bishop, right? Um, but uh, Black's idea was simply to retreat the knight. Yeah, actually Black had another idea in mind. It, it, I think it's quite clever. Um, if you get to a position like this, you can ask, like, um, these are the two bishops we are talking about, the uh, double S bishops. So, uh, who is the better of, of this, these bishops? I mean, the bis white bishop on f6, f6 looks very strong because seemingly the, the black king could be in danger. Um, and what is black bishop on e6 doing? But um, it turns out it, it's not so easy, because black has this move, queen a4. And uh, just to give you an idea, if queen d2, then there's a sacrifice here. And uh, rook g8 next, so, so that's what he's threatening. And if he tries to avoid the queen exchange with queen e2, I mean, Black's point is, if uh, white exchanges queen, then his king on e8 is not a problem. He could move it to the queen side, and maybe this this bishop is only hitting thin air, right? So, um, uh, if queen e2, queen g4, and I think you mentioned d4 before. Now there are lots of threats here. Um, 
bishop could come to c4, could come to d5, and um, it seems like this bishop here is, is getting strong compared to this one. Um, so things are not always as easy as they might look visually. So um, if he takes, exchanges queens and plays rook b1, then we can consider a position like king d7 and if check and rook b1, black can actually take on b7 and play king c8. So now every square on the 7th rank is covered, white has to go back and black plays rook g4. So what do we have here? Black has a double pawn here, um, but actually black is a lot better because white has weaknesses here, his bishop doesn't look too good, whereas um, black has ideas like this, that would be an ideal square, right? Attacking both weaknesses. Then he can start to advance this pawn and activate this bishop. And maybe his king is closer to the center compared to uh, white on g1. So black is actually better in this position. So So in the game we saw something similar. After he decided to take with the b-pawn. And here he decided to exchange queens. And this is interesting now. Black sacrifices a pawn to activate his bishop. Um, of course, there are some problems with <coughs> this. So that's why Black simply plays rook b3 first. <coughs> cannot take because be a strong fast pawn. So here black is definitely better. He has a lot of initiative and uh, we can again compare bishops. So uh, opposite colored bishops is a lot about having the initiative and uh, this is quite an unpleasant position for white who doesn't really have a, a White lacks a plan on how to improve his position. Position is very passive, so black is definitely better here. And um, he tries to free himself with a pawn sacrifice, but it doesn't really improve this bishop. It, it's not attacking anything, and um, so. Uh, and um, we're talking about the bishops here. Um, this bishop here is not attacking much either. Um, so, um, in, on principle, it could still be a bad bishop. Like, uh, I mean, white, white can put all the pawns on, on the opposite color, but black has the initiative, and together with the remaining, the other pieces here, this is a very strong piece because. Um, E1 is covered, and uh, I mean, you can go to E4 and uh, help to undermine D4, which is uh, an attacking point. Actually, Black had this uh, exchange sacrifice in the position, um, which is very strong. So, um, in a position like this, um, White would like to exchange one pair of rooks, but it's not possible because b1 is covered. Um, 
Black doesn't really have any weaknesses in the position. You have e6, but it's covered by the bishop. Um, and he can slowly, he can, it's easy to improve the position. You can, and there are uh, many fonts to attack. You can bring the king in, you can, black can do a lot of things. And white can almost do nothing. So black is clearly better here. In chapter 2 of the book, I consider exchange sacrifices as a way to isolate uh, the double S bishop. Uh, so, by making this exchange sacrifice, um, this guy here is being more isolated, and now it's even worse uh, on the dark squares. And um, so, um, the exchange sacrifice is really a way to. Uh, yeah, to worsen the, the, the bishop. Um, and um, this is not just in this game, it happens in a lot of Grandmaster games. Um, so it's, it's quite a common uh, idea. And it's good to know. So um, I didn't just find one crazy game where it happens to, to be good. Uh, it's, I have a lot of games during the book where it's actually a good weapon. Um, yeah, um, let me see. Before we move on to the next position, um, I want to know uh, if you fully understand my idea of the double S bishop. Um, is it clear what, what I'm trying to tell you? Because I'm going to show you a position and I'm going to give you some time to think about it. And uh, I just want you to know if, do you have any questions before we get there? Or do you just yeah, want to? Hmm? What about the expression of fighting Like uh, who's fighting in the crime? Bishop that is fighting in the in Grey Knight. Yeah, when it's behind its own pawns or? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't really consider it. Um, I don't use the expression in the book. But um, I have some positions where the bishop is simply there to defend. And then. Um, and then you uh, you use the other pieces to uh, to get an initiative on the other side, and you just have this passion, this defending bishop on the other. And it, it's okay if you can be active otherwise on the board. So um, it's of course bad if you have a bishop behind his own pawn and you just pass it. That's you know uh, that's not good. You should avoid that. Uh, in, in that case, you can talk, begin to talk about the bishop being bad. Um, also because of the position, but um, yeah. Any questions before we get to the position? You just want to see the position. <laughs> okay. So this is um, yeah, John Kaseko. So let's talk a bit about the position. Um, so it, it's it's white to move. Um, so if we look at the position, we see that uh, black has this unique bishop that white doesn't have. So it seems to be a good bishop because of the pawns. And um, let's not talk about good and bad bishop. Of course, we noticed. Um, Um, what do you think about this bishop on e7? It's a bad bishop. Yeah, it doesn't look too good, right? Mm. <coughs> but um, if we have this goalkeeper logic in mind, we can we we can also reason like this. We can say, okay, uh, if you're black and you're 
start to reason about the position. If I have time, I can maybe bring my king in here, centralize the king. It's okay that I have this bishop on e7. It's, it's defensive. It's, it's, it's only def defending d6. But I have, uh, I have many other pieces that can try to uh, be active. So it's okay that I have this uh, bishop on e7 because I have other um, pieces. Um, Black could also argue that uh, this bishop on e3, it is hitting the same wall of pawns as the bishop on e7, so why should it be any better? It, it's not something that I came up with. Actually, Kramnik, he, he had the same logic in, um, when he wrote about the Stonewall Dutch that uh, you have the stonewall, then white has the bishop on g2, uh, and black has the bishop on c8, and they are basically hitting the same wall of pawns in the center. So, um, but, um, yeah. So, um, do you have any ideas what, um, what white could play? How would you approach this position with white? Any suggestions? Yeah, if you take on d6, uh, if you realize you have to take on d6, then I can rightfully ask, uh, uh, why was the bishop on e7 bad then? I mean, it, it obviously was a good defender since you want to take on d6. And then, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, let's try to see that. What's your idea? So, with a pawn? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, good at seeing those. Um, but I can take on the. Yeah, it's an interesting option, taking on d6. Maybe it's not so good at all. You see, it says a slight advantage to white. So, um, um, white has sacrificed the exchange. So, uh, for a human, the first thing to consider is, uh, I want to exchange this rook white has. Because with every exchange, um, so I think it's relevant to consider rook d8. That's very human thinking that the computer doesn't suggest it. But if we try to exchange a lot of pieces, then in an end game, my rook versus your minor piece could could tell. So uh, let's see what happens after this. It's important to consider because it's it's one of the remaining pieces when you sacrifice the exchange. You always have this kind of thinking. Uh, you always think in these worst case scenarios. You don't want to sacrifice the exchange because what if I end up losing the end game, right? Everybody knows that. Um, that's the way you think. So, um, so I don't want to analyze too deep on this position, but it's interesting that the computer says like uh, white is clearly better here, and. Um, of course, he has this two passed pawns. The king is close to support it. Um, the position is stable. Uh, white's possible weaknesses are very hard to get at. So um, this is basically why white has an advantage here. So the idea of taking on d6 is actually uh, not too bad. Um, in the book, I consider a lot of examples where actually in order to break through, in order to transform the advantage, you often uh, have to exchange this so-called bad bishop. Um, it, happens, it really happens a lot. Um, bishop looks bad, but uh, in order to 
break through, you have to exchange it. And then, of course, you can ask, was the bishop bad then if if you exchanged it? So it's um, to me, it, it just shows that the bishop was not bad. It was uh, yeah, doublet or something in between. It's too early to say. Um, but actually, White has a stronger move in this position. Does anyone has suggestions? Ah, you could see it on the computer, right? <laughs> I didn't turn it off. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody said B4, right? Um, you all saw the right move, right? That was actually the play, the move short played in the game. So um, he took on A4. Um, so the idea is now this is a huge threat, and then knight comes to c4, and white has a dominant position. So black has to play rook a8, and then you take on d6, an improved version of it. Um, let's consider b4 for, for a while. Yeah, it seems black can play like this. It seems okay for black. But uh, now suddenly uh, this bishop is undefended and this gives white an extra move. The game continued like this. And here he played bishop b4. And after h5, we got back into the game like this. Um, actually, in this position, uh, it's, it's stronger just to take the bishop right away and play bishop b4. And one of the main points here is that um, White has this bishop on b4, so he's looking to, to straighten his light squares, uh, the opposite color of the bishop. He would like to keep his rook on the board because its remaining pieces, uh, they, they could work well together. And black is trying to exchange it, and after rook d8 he simply plays rook d5. And uh, if you try to exchange the rook now, there will be two massive passed pawns in the center. So this is really losing for black, that was a game. Uh, black has no real counterplay. Um, white has a clear plan to advance the pawn supported by the king and bishop. And again, if you want to create some kind of counterplay on the king side, it's, it's really far away. So it's slow. So this is bad for black. So after bishop b4, black could have retreated the, the bishop. Um, because now, you know, there's, he can use his bishop to uh, force an exchange. And even though this is um, slightly better for white, suddenly it, it's, it's much harder for white to advance the pawns without a rook on the board. Because now he needs to control the light squares, and it's not so easy for the knight to control the light squares here. Um, that's one other difference between knight and bishop. The bishop very easily controls the dark square, right? Does it all the time. But the knight changes color with every move, so in order to control the light squares, uh, to get the pawns moving, it's, it's not so easy. So. Um, yeah, the, the position is just uh, unclear here. So I can briefly show you the rest of the game. Um, my plan is very easy. Yeah, he 
sacrifice is back, but what, what can he do? C5 and A6 and King B5. I like this move because uh, the rook here supporting the pawn and covering all the weaknesses. So it's a perfect place for the rook. Gets some counterplay going by taking a pawn, then the next move he resigns. Um, by so, so it, it's a um, position like this. Um, it makes you wonder about this bishop on, on e7, right? And uh, since white is going to sacrifice and exchange on d6, well, why should this bishop be bad? That's the obvious question to ask, right? So, um, you can say that visually it's, it's bad, but um, there's just a lot of other things going on in the position, so it's too early to say. Yeah, I found a few games, or we're going to discuss them shortly. Um, yeah, I want you to... Let me show you a position from the endgame section. Um, I was black in this position, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't win it. Um, and I went home and I analyzed it a lot, and um, but I, I haven't found a win to this day. Actually, I found a lot of defense for white. Um, some of the defenses are really hard to find for white. So, um, but there, there is no win. So, um, yeah, you, you can say that that uh, white has a very bad position. I mean, his bishop is on the same color as all his pawns. Uh, black has king space. Um, he has no, I mean, he has all the time in the world to improve, try to move his knight. Um, so, but still black cannot win. Um, and I was reminded, this position reminds me a little bit about the, the, the Russian saying that goes, um, even the worst bishop is better than the best knight. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that one, but uh, it's a bit exaggerated that uh, the worst bishop should be better than the best knight, but somehow this position uh, <laughs> maybe shows it. I mean, you have um, to, 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 normal, to the normal mind, this is a bad bishop because on the same color as the pawns, and um, white ha black has a good strong knight, and uh, I mean this looks awful for white. But um, the bishop actually easily it, it's easy to defend all the pawns, and it's difficult for black to do anything because he has a weakness here on his own on, on g6 that the king can attack. So um, so, but I did try a winning attempt here, and I played king d3. And king f3. And um, here I played knight d5 and uh, I took on c3. No, I took on b4. And this only led to a draw. There was nothing, nothing special. So um, if black really wants to test white, um, he has to play knight c4. But you know, it, this, it's, it's very difficult for black to play like this because now the position becomes, becomes very sharp and uh, five moves ago you had like a solid advantage it seems and an excellent position 
now suddenly you you need to calculate a lot of tactics and uh, um, the pawn race, and, and you can also lose. So um, so this is the main line. Um, you can't take it because black's pawns are simply too fast, something like this. So um, I take. White continues. And just to give you an idea of difficult de defense White is, is on, is he only has one move that secures the draw here in Bishop d6. And the point is that he has to defend against d4. And after something like this, there's no check on a6 winning the pawn. And it will be. That's why the bishop has to be on d6, and now he will prevent, promote next move. So, um, difficult move to find. Um, if he takes on c3, I think there is some problems with uh, you cannot. Okay, it's. Um, I just want to show the main line first. a3 takes takes. Then G4 is the simple. I'm going to draw. You suggested queen takes c3 here? Um, let's take it afterwards. So the computer doesn't want to waste any time. Goes g4. Computers in the draw, but uh, <laughs> it's very yeah. But trust me, I analyzed this uh, at length. And it's, uh, there's no win for black. But um, you said in this position. Try. You want to go with the knight to d3, and <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and what, what do you want to do next? To attack the pawn. good to consider. Um, I actually, before this position we started with, I actually tried, you know, the knight around for 20 moves uh, before I decided on king d3 and to go for the sharp uh, winning attempt. But, um, yeah, it's just curious that this bishop that it's on the same pawns, pawns on the same color, it's actually good for white because then the pawns are easier to defend. No win for for black man. Okay, before we go to today, some of today's games, I want to show you um, a game um, from 
Gelfand's hand. It, it seems appropriate since he's coming this week to the festival. Um, yeah, um, why bury bishop a8? Because the move uh, Gelfand played um, was knight d5. Um, and the question is, why not just, um, that's what that, that was actually played in the game. So, um, what, what can we, what do you think about this bishop on a I want to use the terminology that I used here and uh, some reasoning. Um, okay, in this game there's an actual reason why he, he, he played like this. So he, he he's a strong player, Gautam, so this is an excellent concept. But, um, so why did he let his bishop on A8 be buried like this? Or what, what's the point? It, this bishop does look very, very bad, right? Um, we should also notice that um, white also has a bishop that could be a problem. So this one on e1, you have pawns on the same color, it's not really attacking anything. Um, so, um, so um, so why did Gilfan play like he, he did? Yeah, but it's also passive at the moment, right? Yeah, maybe it's not too bad because white also has this bishop. Um, so maybe staying passive, play bishop b7, a6 is, is not too bad. But I think Gelfan, he had another plan in mind, which um, explains why this bishop is, is not bad on a8. So he, he had a plan. Um, so um, he wanted to get the rook to the C file. He wanted to conquer the C file. And um, it's not easy for white to counter. I mean, uh, he played queen b2 in the game and then came rook c8. If he tries to play queen c2, you can play bishop b7 first and then uh, rook c8. So, uh, and just just to consider this, um, this is not a very good sacrifice because uh, there are probably many reasons here. But uh, if he had, if White had very active pieces, then maybe he could justify this uh, yeah, sacrifice. But then now we suddenly see that um, this bishop that was maybe a potential problem. It's not actually contrib contrib <laughs> it's doing anything um, to make White's position look impressive. So this is, this is not good for White. Um, so um, Black will get his rook to the C file in this position. <coughs> um, so this was the uh, Okay. And now we play rook c4. And um, this is kind of the answer to the question because uh, you, you cannot call this bishop bad because there are still other um, pieces and pawns in the position. 
and suddenly it shows why because you know black is threatening maybe queen c7 and if white takes like this suddenly we have a strong path pawn and um, yeah this bishop is suddenly on the long diagonal so um, so because of an extra rook and maybe the queen um, this bishop was not bad at all but now I think this is bad for white um, so instead white he played bishop f1 he wants to chase the rook away and then maybe he will seize control of the c5 um, whatever but then uh, Gelfand played knight d6 in this position so he's, he's willing to sacrifice the exchange here um, So we notice if this is once again uh, we're talking about we can this is actually an exchange sacrifice. Uh, White is exchanging off his bishop and then he is left with uh, now this looks like a problem to me and uh, opposite colored bishops. Black has the initiative here and suddenly this bishop is doing a lot less. So. Uh, this is really, I tried to ask the computer, but it, it, it finds some kind of brawl here, but uh, this looks unpleasant for... for it was Bishop has a very strong place, and so white has some weaknesses on white squares, so... Yeah, I mean, the threat is, of course, queen e4. I mean, you have to, this, this, this looks like survival for, for, for white. Uh, check. Uh, this doesn't look pleasant for white and uh, yeah, black has a draw if he wants so uh, yeah. not looks scary for white to play like this right but um, but this knight d6 is really the justification. Uh, that's why Gilfand he buried his bishop on the gate. Uh, I'll just briefly show you the rest of the game because this is not a game where a lot of things happen. But uh, if White had played like this, something a lot could have happened. So. Um, Yeah, and of course, this is not really a pawn sacrifice. I mean, taking this pawn looks not really. Yeah, this, you don't want to do that. So it's a safe pawn sacrifice. I would say. Um, change queens and. Uh, I mean, this is, he's just relocating the bishop on d7 and uh, um, plays a6 first and then attacks the pawn on, on e4 and uh, uh, the player's just agreed for a draw here. So. so if you just look at the game on the surface, it doesn't, it's not too exciting, but uh, there was just this moment, this brilliant decision by Gilfand where he played knight d5. Um, okay, um, I want to show you some uh, game extracts from today's first round that I found. Um, is any one of the players here? Today? <laughs> Just want to know. <laughs> okay. This is um, a very typical French position, and um, it's uh, about uh, equal. So, um, 
Now Black plays this clever move. He plays knight d7. And uh, with this move, he is, he is asking white a question. Um, because he wants to play like this and undermine the defense of e5. So um, it's not so easy to counter. I mean, queen e3, bishop c5, what to do? Hmm? Yeah, uh, he does that in the game. Um, so, if we're talking about bishops in this position, um, can you point out some possible doublet bishops here? Some bishops that could maybe turn bad. Talk about what, what are the interesting bishops here to discuss? Yeah. Yeah, the whites. This is typically a white bishop that could be uh, a problem. But I mean, after bishop c5, he probably doesn't want to take it because black can take back the pawn. So, uh, but it's yeah. These are the two bishops. It, it's very typical of the French. You, you saw it in the other line. It's. Uh, Um, so some of the other factors here is this pawn could be weak. Of course, this pawn there's a point to attack here as well. Um, but in the game, um, White failed to uh, solve the the challenge to his e5 pawn. He started out with queen e3. Um, so now he played bishop c8, king g1. And now he took on d7. It's uh, understandable. Um, and he played knight d2. So, um, what is to say about this bishop? How can we, you know, try to explain this bishop? What, what is there to say? Anyone who? Mine is not supposed to be down. Yeah, my like this? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I will probably play c3 at some point. And um, of course you can uh, you can play the bishop to e4, but I could also argue, okay, but it's not attacking anything. So, um, mm. what? What everybody is thinking in a position like this is what if we exchange the queens, exchange the dark squared bishop and place a knight on d4. This is like the nightmare in game for black in the French, right? Knight on d4 against this bishop. Knight is very flexible. Bishop cannot do anything. Um, white kings come in on, on the dark squares and white has every chance <coughs> to improve the position. Um, but the thing is, um, you don't just exchange the queens and the bishop. It, it doesn't just happen like this. Um, so it's it's part of the position. This, these are the, the other factors, and this is why it's uh, it's it's too early to call this bishop bad. Um, we can we can try to uh, see what happens after bishop e8. Um, let's just try and move like c3. Yeah, this is perfectly okay. Problem there. What if I play a3 to play g4? Yeah. Now we have a queen defense, so... Basically, black has one uh, weakness in this position, and it's quite easy to defend it. <coughs>
Okay, black is completely okay here. Um, he played bishop b5. This is quite a clever move. Um, at least it, it made uh, white panic a bit here. Yeah. So um, the thread is clear. Bishop takes e2. And um, yeah, the computer suggests knight f4, but I, I think there's a reason why he didn't play it. Uh, the lines will show uh, in a minute. Um, but he should have played knight f4. But the critical line to consider here is uh, this one. And then takes there, white can take there. And this looks unpleasant. So this bishop is still helping the in the attack. Um, and if you look at this position, it looks slightly unpleasant for white. Um, and if you go to a light square now, then bishop comes in with a check. But it's actually not a problem. Even king f3, I think, is good enough. And check, and you go back and attack the bishop. So it's not really a problem here. But it, it looks a bit scary that, that you have to run to g3 here. And, uh, so uh, he should have played that. And instead, in the game, he, uh, he blundered. Um, my guess is that he felt under pressure, uh, pressure but uh, of course I can't tell that, but this is an outright uh, mistake. Um, um, won that pawn in the game. So. So, um, you, you've probably seen commentary uh, on games many times where, uh, you know, in a position like this, it, it's easy to call the, 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 the French bishop the bad bishop, but it, it really depends on, on many things. I mean, right now it's defending e6, and you can you can use the the queen and the bishop here for for attacking purposes. And then maybe in some lines the bishop can be active. And also we saw that at black can actually take it easy and just uh, improve the bishop on g6, no problem. So. Okay. Yeah, I think this next position is interesting. Um, Blending Scholar is not here today, right? If he were here, we could ask him about some thoughts. But um, this opening is interesting. Um, Black is attacking d4. <coughs> and now only knight f6 has been played in this position one time before, according to my game database. Uh, if black takes the pawn, then queen a4 check with the knight. Um, but black played a novelty, he played knight a6. And um, um, why took on a6 here? I think it's a very interesting decision. Um, And he played queen a4. Um, I 
Yeah. Um, okay, King of Eight. It's not a big deal for Black to move the King to G7. Um, this line I considered before. Um, uh, both players have Bishop now, and in these kind of structures with C4, D5, this bishop could be a problem later. And it's also opposite color bishop, so if one of the players succeeds in, in getting the initiative, then he's definitely better. Um, so uh, if we were to say anything about this bishop on E2, you can say, okay, it's, it's this defending C4, it's a very good purpose for the bishop for now. And then uh, white has actually space in the center, could be useful. For instance, that could be an attack point on e7, which is also typical of these positions. Um, so for now, this uh, we don't call this bishop anything, it's just a bishop on e2. Um, white has other pieces where he can attack, he can maybe advance the pawns, no problem. Um, so this is one way of playing the position, just an example. Um, so you see that um, by having this bishop on e2, defending this pawn, uh, the bishop looks a bit passive, but on the other hand, it gives white freedom to just advance his pawns. So we have a slightly passive bishop, but it gives us freedom otherwise on, on other places on the board. So with this logic, we can actually say that the bishop is very useful because it's, um, yeah. Um, so I just, um, you know, I just tried, what happens if black tries to isolate this bishop uh, on e2 to, to Black tries to prove that his bishop is bad and he has a better knight. Um, I think if we considered only an endgame with knight against bishop, uh, again the worst case scenario thinking, um, I'm not sure black would be better, but uh, maybe white would be slightly careful. There's still the king could come in and I don't think white has any problems, but Later, it could be he black could try to show that his knight is better than the bishop, but this is all we don't have to discuss this now because there are two rooks and queens on the board, and um, I mean uh, uh, white is completely fine here. Uh, he has points he can then attack by himself. Uh, he can maybe advance the pawns. Uh, he can play f5. So uh, so. White has another activity here. It's, it's not only about the bishop and uh, the knight, the fight bishop versus knight. There's a lot of things going on in this position. Um, yeah. So it's clear what black wants to do. He wants to place the bishop on f6, covering e7, then play his king to g7, and then um, try to improve his pieces. So what should white do in a position like this? What would you do with white? Um, the b4 idea is good. We, we saw it also be before. Why not advance the pawns? Um, c4 is, is covered. Um, maybe this is not so effective. I don't know if white is black is going to play this anyway. So, um, um, but let's consider the, the, the idea with b4. Um, the point is in the game, uh, white spent too much time and then he fails to find an active plan 
and then slowly Black takes over the initiative and he's definitely better and then he wins a, a nice game. Um, for instance, he, he plays b3 here, which is not really very active, so he fails to find an active plan. So let's consider something like e3, e4. Um, wing back, tick tick, and then knight b5. Um, f4. And uh, I mean, why should white be worse in this position? He has some activity over here. The knight is, is uh, yeah, strongly placed. He has space in the center, and c4 is is easily covered by this bishop. So. Uh, this is just an interesting position. If he wants, he can maybe play bishop c4 at some point. Um, so uh, this position is just unclear. So, um, but when you see the game and how black won, it, it's easy to say like uh, the bishop on e2 was a bad bishop because it was behind its own pawns. Uh, but the way white played it in the game. Um, the bishop actually became bad because suddenly black had the initiative on the queen side. I mean, if you look at the bishops, then white's bishop is not, it's hitting its own pawns and the black one is, is, is hitting towards the, the queen side. So if black can get some kind of initiative over here with the pieces, this bishop would be very strong and this would do nothing. So, and this is what happened in the game. He played b3. At a5, <coughs> and um, white is not really white lacks an active plan here. Uh, bishop f3, not sure why. Yeah, and um, black is about to get the initiative going on the queen side, so. I think at this point, um, Black clearly has the better bishop because he will soon have the initiative over there. So, uh, opposite colored bishops, uh, White's bishop won't be doing much. So, um, and then it only take you know a little mistake like Queen C1, and suddenly Black is. Uh, oh. And the queen exchange doesn't really uh, help white because black still has the initiative over there. This move is probably to free the bishop. King protects e7, so now he can move his bishop. Bending a2. Yeah, and this is really a difficult position for white. So um, I will not condemn all of White's move here, um, but now he desperately tries to uh, activate his bishop, and by doing so he gets a, a, a bad pawn structure. But uh, I, you, you can't blame him. This is a difficult position. Um, to defend C4 and now he's getting mated. So, so this was the end of the game. So my point with this game is that White was completely okay but when he failed to find an active plan his big ship became very uh, became actually bad on E2 and F3. So uh, 
but I, I'm sure you will find um, annotators who just uh, knowing the result of the game they will um, you know at, at this point they will call this bishop on e2 bad but it's it's way too soon for that it's just too much happening in the position <laughs> Do you have any questions to this uh, double bishop or any other questions? When will your book be available in electronic forms? Ah, it's a good question. Shells are full. Ah, um, not yet, I think. They just uh, did it with my rook versus two minor pieces. So it will not come in physical form anymore. So, but with this one, I hope not too soon because um, this is not like an opening book. So in, in, in three years' time, this will still be you know, relevant. It's not like it's outdated um, after three years. So I hope they will not uh, do it. I would probably object if they asked me. <laughs> so, um, in the book, I write that uh, I think um, um, players with uh, 1900 Elo uh, or more will get the most out of the book. But of course, uh, everyone who is uh, ambitious and want to improve. Um, can read the book. Um, so, um, let me hear if you think, does it make sense, the concept of uh, double bishops? And, or else you, you can just ask some questions. I could also just, I could also just show you another position, but uh, I want to hear if you have any questions. What's the idea to write about this topic? How did you uh, find it, this idea? This, uh, this idea yeah, I, I think it started with the difference between knight and bishop, because it's usually like this. In the Nimso engine, you, you get the bishop for the knight, and then you, you get this, suddenly you, you already have like, um, um, if you take a position like this, um, one of the main lines in the Nimsu engine, you, all, you already have the fight against knight versus bishop. I mean, um, it's not only that going on, but white is very strong on the dark squares in this position, because this is his unique bishop, black doesn't have it. But uh, on the other hand, he could be weak on the light squares, so it's really, it's really about that. I think that's where it started. Um, basically, between the fight between bishop and knight, and as I said, I, I think it's funny that these uh, are curious that these two pieces have about the same value because they couldn't be more different. Um, so I think that's why it's done. Could you sort of uh, simplify? It? position by saying that by definition your bishops can't be bad if the rest of your position is good enough. If you have a mate in one, for example, then by definition you can't have bad bishops. Yeah, but, but uh, why do you see annotators all the time call a bishop bad just because it's visually bad if you look at the board? I mean, you, you could easily say to that annotator, okay, but uh, the rest of the position is good enough. But it, it's, it, it's so tempting, it's so easy for them to do it, and they do it all the time. And sometimes if the bishop is not so bad, they, they say bad bishop in you know, quotation marks. Um, so it's... Uh, <laughs> um, but you have a point there, and, and of course uh, I'm trying to explain why the rest of the position is good enough. I use the other factors, like space, remaining pieces, and, um, but don't you sometimes see them write that optically black or white is better, however, 
in reality, uh, yeah, but the uh, position is equal or something like that. Yeah, but sometimes they just uh, call a bishop bad or right, even if it's not true. Um, so. Yeah, but but uh, the way people use it is a little bit strange because then they they say bad with uh, so they are not. I mean, Kaspar does it all the time in his uh, my great predecessors. He likes go bad bishop like this all the time. So. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, obviously, bad bishops is related with the pawn's position. Uh, we talk about bad bishops. Should we equally talk about bad knights or even bad rooks and bad queens? Or why is it just the bishops? Yeah, because they're colorblind. That's why. I mean, you 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 can. Um, I mean, even if, if, if you have a bishop down in your king's position, just defending down there, it could be permanently bad. But if you have a knight on f8 defending h7, everybody knows that, okay, if the attack goes, it's over, then the knight from f8 can, can be active again. So it's, not, it's only the bishop that can be you know, permanently bad. But uh, in some position, it, it doesn't matter because, okay, this is just my defending piece, and. For instance, uh, the king, king's engine is, is a very good example. Uh, that's, um, um, I mean, people have stopped, stopped to talk about this bishop on g7, which is in, uh, it's a double bishop, because, uh, you know, you have it behind its own pawns, and, um, but, you know, every king's Indian player knows that uh, this is not a problem for now, because, hey, I have a lot of remaining pieces, the queens are still on the board, I'm going to attack this fellow, and um, even if white gets a knight on e4 against this bishop on g7, it's not really a problem, because I have other people's I, uh, pieces, I can still attack, I can still, you know, it's... So it's like, it, it has become part of chess culture, that uh, we're not afraid of this bishop on, on g7 anymore. So this is one main line in, in, in the King's Indian, goes like this. And um, I think f3 is mostly played here, and then comes f4. And we have the fight uh, king side versus queen side. Uh, and again, uh, this, is, this is chess culture now. People just play f4 without thinking, but uh, why, why do you bury your own bishop on g7? Because you know there's attack going on, and uh, ah, I mean you don't need this bishop. Maybe you, you can just play rook f7 and bishop f8, and this it's a very good bishop because uh, it defends the pawn on, on d6. Your only weakness, and then you can bring the, the rook here and, and move the g pawn and mate. So it's um, people stop thinking about that this is actually a dominant bishop, or uh, that it could be a problem. Um, so, but e4 here, um, the point for white here is that if black goes f4 and white hasn't played f3, you could continue with something like this. This is attacking uh, 6, so 98, and then you have bishop g4. And here I think white is better. Usually when you can get this bishop g4 in, you but white is better, because a lot of the attacking potential goes away if, if white can exchange this bishop on c8. Um, but I'm not sure that that's on the computer. Um, I still think um, I, I white should be better here because he can exchange this. Yeah, the computer is not the right one to ask here. It doesn't see the long term. Um, advantage. So white is better here after bishop g4. But um, black has another option after e4. He can take on e4. 
and play knight f5, trying at some point to go to, to d4. And again, if we consider this knight against this uh, bishop in an endgame, it, it would be horrible for black, but people know that, okay, that queen, rooks, uh, bishop, um, and as long as we have pieces, this might be a weakness, but d5 is also a weakness for white, or it could be. So it, it's not so simple. So one, one sample, if, if black tries to uh, consolidate his knight on e4, like this. Now he's ready to, after knight d4, he can even exchange the, the bishops here, and uh, it looks like this is being isolated more and more, this bishop, but black can just play bishop g7, and uh, this is just uh, <coughs> an unclear position. I mean, white has the knight here, but in reality he has two knights that want to be on this square. And he cannot exchange, he cannot force an exchange of uh, pieces. Black has lots of ways to improve his position here. Uh, bishop d7, queen e7, the other rook over. It's just an interesting position. Because there are many pieces left on the board. So, uh, but I think that it, it's, it's, it's just not a, it's, it's not only a fight of words. That, that, that I do in the book. I'm just trying to, to find a terminology that explains my thinking. And uh, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. One more question. Is it so in general that players uh, think bishops should be uh, immediate, get a good place, and uh, should be a good place in the early stage of, of the game? And uh, your idea, your uh, concept, uh, uh, means that uh, okay, your bishop can stay uh, somewhere or maybe passive, but uh, in uh, developing you know, the game, the bishop can uh, get strong and get into uh, back into the game. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also think uh, bishop g7 is okay. Uh, you can think long, I think a long term that the bishop can uh, get strong uh, later on. So it, it's a very good uh, point because I, I see people in a lot of games if they think they have a bad bishop in the French on c8. It seems like sometimes they, they just uh, try to do everything. Oh, I need to make this bishop good, like it's going to a6. And then they try really hard to activate this bishop because they have this idea it's bad. And by doing so, um, it, it's not necessary. And suddenly they find the other problems, like e6 needs defending, or whatever. But, but I see that a lot, um, that people are trying too hard. I mean. And, and the good point you make is that uh, you know take it easy. It's not you don't have to panic because it's 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 not the only thing going on in the position. Yeah. Yes. So should we say stop uh, stop uh, saying to ourselves uh, I have a bad pawn structure but act in minor pieces or I have. A Queen is strong in place, but my king's position is weak, etc. And instead, try to look at the position as a whole. Yeah. Are either better or equal or worse. Yeah, and uh, I'm not the, the first one to say that, uh, but uh, yeah, it, 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 of course, it makes it more complicated to explain things when suddenly it's not so simple. Um, if you can't just call the bishop bad, and you know it's. Explaining becomes more, you know, complicated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, when I go through the chapter on the advanced French, um, I have 16 que questions, 16 positions, and 16 questions where I test the reader um, on this thinking of uh, double edged bishops. And then, of course, there is the uh, exercise section with 30 exercises. Um, but yeah, you, you should think more broadly about the position. That's I, I think actually the computer is a very good uh, aid there, because it really sees the dynamics of the position, not just what it looks like on the surface. I mean, that's why people started to play the Benoni now again, or, uh, because suddenly uh, the computer sees all the... I mean, everybody looks at the pawn on d6, says it's weak, but the computer finds all kinds of you know, ways to 
keep the game going. And uh, so uh, the same with the Grünfeld defense. I mean, uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was considered an unsigned opening, right? Maybe 20 years ago um, now. But today it's really uh, the main line because, yeah, also because of the computers, I think. They see all the dynamics in the position. And then suddenly makes it playable. Yeah. Okay, um, I want to end here, and, and I want to end by saying that uh, it's possible to buy the book afterwards if you want. And uh, Ole Knudsen is here from the, the book sales, and uh, you can use cash and credit card if you want or even mobile pay. And uh, yeah, I will be here to sign it if you want. So otherwise, I thank you for coming. Thank, thank you to Esben Lund for an interesting lecture. <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs>